So, it becomes a very difficult situation because now I've been out of the organisation for a, about a year, I would say. Um, and I completely cut off communication with every single worldly person. Um, but when you have to live your life like a hermit, and about six, seven weeks go by, and I've not seen a soul, I hadn't, I hadn't gone out and seen anybody, apart from my mum and dad, perhaps at meal times, um, I didn't really see anybody else, to be honest with you. And I'm a very, very social person, so it makes it made that situation very, very difficult. And uh, a friend of mine, um, who I used to go to school with, he sent me a message over Facebook and said, "Do you want to go out and play some snooker tonight?" And I thought, "Well, can't hurt. I'm going to go and play some snooker with an old with an old school friend." So I did, and I went out and played snooker with him. Um, had a couple of drinks, and you know what? I had a really good time. Got back at a good hour. Um, got up and went to the meeting the next day. No problems at all. Um, and then I went out with him again, and um, I met a girl who I become sort of quite good friends with. Um, and um, you know, at that time I was very, very depressed still, um, very, very confused because I felt that the only love that I was getting was from some people that essentially were atheists, uh, by people that had no belief in God, but they were, you know, they were welcoming me and you know. Being, being good friends with me, and yet my own sister would walk past me in the street and shun me. And I just thought, and, and you, you can't comprehend just how much that hurts when that happens. So I started looking at these people and started associating with them, and I kept on thinking to myself, why are these people so bad? You know, why am I not supposed to be associating with them? Because, you know, they make me happy. You know, they, 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 you know, they do anything for me. And these, these are people that I hadn't really known that, especially a long time. Anyway, um, because I'd managed to get some money under my belt, um, I managed to get myself a little little bed set flat. Um, um, it's called a studio flat if you're watching this in America. Um, and uh, for a very cheap uh, amount of money, and I managed to move out, uh, move out of mum and dad's. I then got a visit from my local elders, and I thought, oh, you know, perhaps this is a good thing, you know. I'm, perhaps they're going to tell me that you know everything's working out okay and I can be reinstated. Um, but no, they came around my house and they said, Jason, if you want to be reinstated, then the third, there's two things you've got to do. Number one, you've got to stop attending our meetings in the Bourne congregation and you need to go back to the one where your ex-wife was, which, he, which is in Sleaford congregation, um, because it's them that need to monitor your progress. Um, that's the first thing you've got to do. The other thing as well is, is that we notice that you've been coming to the meeting with a girl. Um, and uh, I said, yes, yeah. so I said, she's a, she's a friend of mine. And um, they said, well, you can't do this. You are not going to be reinstated if you're if you're in a relationship with, you know, with a, with a girl. So I said, um, I said, I don't understand. I said, the reason that I go to board meetings is because it is the closest one to where it is that I live. And the reason that um, I am attending the meetings with this girl is because she's become a companion to me, and I think at some point we are going to be in a relationship, but actually she's helping me to come back to the meetings. So I said, I don't understand what the issue was. And they said, look, Jason, we don't want to um, get into questions about it, we don't want to get into an argument about it, but look, we want you to be in the truth again. So if you want to be in the truth again, then this is what you're going to have to do. So um, I said, fine. So then they left. Now, bearing in mind that at this point, me and this girl had become good friends. Um, I actually felt like you know we were, become, we were becoming more than good friends. And um, she was helping me to become a witness again. She was helping me to get to the meetings. You know, she was um, on a th on a Thursday evening when I really didn't feel like going um, to the meetings and everything. She'd be ringing me and saying, "Are you at the meeting? No. Well, make sure you go and everything else." She was encouraging me. So I thought, well, "What? I don't I don't get it. Why why am I being told to en end this you know friendship?" And um, it was coming up to Memorial Day. And I got on my knees to, to God one day and I said, Right Jehovah, you've told me what it is that I need to do to come back to you and I'm going to do it. So 
I went over to this girl's house and I said, look, we need to stop having this kind of companionship. You know, we need to just end things. I said, I've got to be a witness again. She said, yeah, I understand, no problem. And um, I also then went back to uh, a meeting over in Sleaford. And I went to the meeting in Sleaford, bearing in mind I'd, I'd cut ties with, um, you know, this girl and everything. And um, I went over to the meeting in Sleaford and um, sat at the back of the hall like I usually do. And nothing had changed. I was still getting sniggered out by all of my ex-wife friends. I was still being laughed at. I was still being... Uh, people were, were, were looking at me with utter disgust, uh, disgust on their face and everything else. Um, and um, anyway, after this meeting, I texted this girl and she said, and in fairness to her, she replied to me and said, no, you can't have any contact with me, Jason. You know, you want to become a witness again. And I fully respect your decision to do that. So you need to get to stop texting me. And I broke down. And I broke down in tears. And I said to God, I said, Jehovah, you told me you would not test me to beyond what I can bear. And I said, in the past two years, I said, I, I, I gave up my job. I lost my wife. I lost my house. I didn't have enough money to be able to put food on the table. And yet, I still have been trying to get back into your organization and show you that I'm repentant of my sins. So I said, what are you doing to me? Because I said, now you, you're asking me to do these things that I said are going to put me back to square one. And I said, and I just don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't know if, if this is your organization anymore. So I said, I'm going to come to the memorial um, and I'm going to come with this, with this girl. But I said, I need you to tell me that this is your organization and that you actually want me in your organization. Because, you know, if, if not, then I would rather just die at Armageddon because this is just too hard. And I said that from the bottom of my heart to God. And I went along to the memorial with this girl. And um, anyway, I go into the, I go into the, the, the congregation. Saw all my parents, saw my parents and my granddad and everything else, and saw all the all the multitude of friends that I'd got over over the course of twenty years. Not one of them come up and said hello, tried to offer me an encouraging word. Uh, I just got quickly shepherded into the back room and said, right, you sit there, you sit there, and you know, and everything else. And then, and then we sat round and, and passed the bread and wine. And for the first time ever, I, I thought to myself, why are we doing this? Why, why are we just passing the bread and wine round? Now I'd never asked that question before. But I tell you, the the girl who I was with, she said because I said what did you make of the meeting and she said it was the most insulting meeting I've ever been to she said I, I don't even believe in Jesus but she said I, I don't get it she says it's almost as though you're saying that you, you, you know the Lord is there but you kind of want him but you kind of don't she said I don't understand and um, I didn't understand either so I went home and I pulled my Bible out um, and I found a scripture um, and it's in John chapter 6 and verse 53 and it says so Jesus said again I tell you the truth unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you cannot have eternal life within you but anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise that person at the last day and it hit me I just thought why have we why have we why do we never do this as witnesses that was the first time first time ever I questioned a watchtower doctrine and I said to God I said I feel like you're telling me something here I feel like you're telling me that you want me to repent of my sins but you don't want me to be in the Jehovah's Witness organization so I said I just need to leave this with you on the Saturday night I was getting all prepared for the meeting the next day and um, a friend of mine texted me that I would not spoken to in years and said to me, just so you know Jason, I know what your situation is at the moment, um, I attend a, a small church in Grantham um, that I think you'll find very interesting and um, I really felt that that message had come from God. And I really felt like he was saying, you need to go and look elsewhere, Jason, for me. So uh, on the Sunday morning, I, for the first time ever, stepped into another church. And um, 
it was bizarre. It was really weird at that time because, you know, for years I've been used to standing up at a particular time and singing at a certain time. There'd be somebody praying. That there were the same people that would be on the platform. Everyone would be wearing a suit and tie and everything else. And I'd walk and I walked in, and people are wearing the hoodies, and people are waving flags. There are some people standing up. There are some people sitting down. There are some people kneeling on the floor in tears, grieving for the Holy Spirit. And I just thought this is really strange, but I thought no, look, I've got an open mind. You know, let's 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 see out the rest of the meeting and see see what happens. And um, I actually f I felt something different in this in this church. Although I didn't feel like what they were necessarily preaching was you know completely correct. What I felt they had is freedom, um, freedom to express themselves in front of God. And. Um, I started attending this little church on a Sunday. I was going to the Kingdom Hall sometimes on a Thursday and going to this little church on a, on a Sunday. And the contrast was just unbelievable. To, to, you know, I was going there on a Sunday and you know people were, were loving me and everything else and um, you know and even though I'd, I told the, the pastor you know that I'd committed these sins and whatever it was like you know yeah I, I know Jason but you know God, God doesn't hold a grudge, you know. Um, God will forgive you if you've asked Him to. Um, he doesn't hold anything. And He, and he showed me that scripture that He said that He holds your um, your sins as far as away from the sun sets to where the sun rises. And um, really made really made me think that you know what? Yeah, you're right actually. Um, and He said, and He says, your biggest problem is Jason that you haven't forgiven yourself. And He was right. And you know why I hadn't forgiven myself? because the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses did not allow me to. They had the power to say whether or not you're repentant and not God. And that's when I started to think, well, you know, this organization, is it really from God? Or is it trying to be God? Because they're the ones who now actually hold the cards and say whether or not it is I'm, I'm repentant. So I started going along to this, uh, to, to this church on a Sunday. And um, it got quite a few on quite a few occasions they'd asked me to go out to the front of this church or not ask me they'd asked the audience and I wanted to go out and say something and I didn't and it was on one particular Sunday and I was just feeling really broken you know because um, I felt that the organization had lied to me for such a long time um, and I was breaking and um, I thought no do you know what I'm gonna go to the front at the end of the meeting today and I walked to the front and I said to said to the pastor, I said, I'm ready. I said I'm ready to confess my my sins, and I said, and, and I want to do that. And uh, I, I can only rem it was a bit of a blur that what happened then because um, he said, right, okay, no problem. And he put on his his hands on me and, he pra and we prayed together. And he said, I just want you to repeat after me. And he said, Jesus, I come to you because I want to confess my sins to you, and I want to 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 um, acknowledge the fact that you died on the cross for me to set me free from my sins and I said that back and I said it from the bottom of my heart and I just broke down in tears and I felt on that day that I'd been forgiven even though I know that, that God had forgiven me a long time before that I felt like I felt like Jesus had somehow entered me and, and was actually now forcing me to let go of my burden, if you understand what I mean. On that day I was set free, and um, it would only be about seven, eight months ago. About two months ago, the same girl that I'd been talking about throughout this whole testimony, last week she became my wife, <laughs> and she's also come to Christ. And in spite of the fact that all my family are still trapped in this organisation, I tell you, I wake up every day at peace knowing that I know the truth and know that Jesus was the one who set us free from sin and that he will also one day set, set free my family from this organisation. And um, I tell you, when I sort of relay the story, I realise actually how Jesus has manipulated things to ensure that I come to him. And um, 
like I say, and now everything's working out really well. I have a new job, and I'm doing doing quite well. Uh, like I say, I got married about two weeks ago. I just come back from a wonderful honeymoon, and um, we found a small home group where we can um, really express ourselves um, and talk and discuss scripture. And uh, I couldn't be happier. So I'm sorry for the long testimonial, guys, but that was in truth how quickly I could in the um, space of time I had to do it. That's as short as I can make it. So I hope that it's been encouraging to you and that um, you can see you know, that no matter how broken it is that you are, that um, sometimes that's what the Lord needs to happen in order to set you free.